Good evening. The first song can now be number 486. 486. Sing on, ye joyful.
for the prayer of England, 344. 344. Step I take, my Savior goes before me, and with his loving hand he leads away. And with each breath I whisper, I adore thee. Oh, what joy to walk with him each day. Each step I take, I know. gracious and loving God, thank you so much for this day that you have blessed us with. Thank you so much for the opportunities that we've had today to study your word and to worship you, singing songs to you and lifting our prayers to you and hearing your word. We ask, Lord, as we continue through this worship service that you will continue to be with us and bless us with your presence. Help us, Lord, as we sing to you to listen to the words and learn from what we are singing. Help us, Lord, as we hear your word taught, that we may pay attention and glean some things from it that we never knew before, so that we may be examples to those that we come in contact with each day. Thank you so much, Lord, for leading us each step of the way, for give us, giving us the perfect example in your Son as he came to earth and lived a tougher life than what we have to live, yet was perfect. Help us to look to him as our guide and our example as we strive to live for you each day that we are on earth. Thank you, God, for this congregation. Thank you for our leadership and the members that make up this congregation and the harmony that exists here among other congregation as well and congregations and, and we ask Lord that you bless the work that's being put forth through these congregations and help us to grow your kingdom thank you Lord for all the blessings that you give us materially and especially spiritually and help us to realize that we would have nothing if it wasn't 
for what you give to us. Thank you most of all for the blessing of your son and the blessing of forgiveness through his blood. And we ask, hopefully, Lord, that if someone is here that doesn't know that forgiveness or needs to know it, that they will listen so that they can and help us to help them so that they may be with you in eternity. We're so thankful for Jesus coming to earth and dying on the cross for us so that we don't have to. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. We're saying this as the invitation hymn after the lesson this evening. 218. Stand and turn number 273. Song for the lesson. 273.
be studying tonight from Luke chapter 19. If you'd like to be turning to that point, Luke chapter 19. I'm going to begin reading in verse 11. <clears throat> Read a few verses and then look at the parable that Jesus speaks in this section on this occasion. And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable, because he was nigh to Jerusalem, because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. <clears throat> and he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds, and said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him, and sent a message after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. It came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him, to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little, have thou authority over ten cities. The second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said likewise to him, Be thou also over five cities. And another came, saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid up in a napkin. For I feared thee, because thou art an austere man. Thou takest up that thou layest not down, and reapest that thou didst not sow. And he saith unto him, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knewest that I was an austere man, taking up that I laid not down, reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore thou gavest not thy money into the bank, that at my coming I might have required mine own with usury. And he said unto them that stood by, Take from him the pound, and give it to him that hath ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds. For I say unto you that every one, that unto every one, which hath shall be given, and from him that hath not, even that, it, that he shall, even that he hath, shall be taken away from him. But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither, and slay them before me. This parable is a lot like another parable that we find in another section of Scripture, but not to be confused with the parable of the talents, and we'll have a little bit more to say in a moment about that. But when you begin to read this parable, Jesus gives the reason for His giving the parable. He was come nigh unto Jerusalem. And it was obvious that there were those with him who were assuming that the kingdom was going to come immediately. And it was needful that he correct that particular situation, correct their view that the kingdom was to immediately appear. But there seems to be another reason behind this particular parable. You'll notice that he deals with money in this parable. It would seem that he also gives this parable to correct what we might refer to as their value system. What really is important? You might recall from other passages of Scripture relative to the coming of the kingdom that there were those who misunderstood the very nature of the kingdom, that it was to be an earthly kingdom, 
that it would be one where people would be given power and prestige and honor and so forth as was the case in physical earthly kingdoms. So he wanted to correct their value system. Have you ever really stopped to think how many times during our Lord's ministry he said something about money, something about material things? It would be hard to read through those various sections and, and time won't permit us to do that. But you'll remember, for example, in Luke chapter 12, there was a rich farmer who had had a, obviously a bumper crop. And he was going to pull down those barns, build bigger, lay up for himself. Jesus addressed that issue. In Luke chapter 16, he talks about the rich man who was indifferent to the needs of Lazarus, but obviously saved what he had for himself. There was an incorrect view, incorrect value system in that regard. Then in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus raises a question. What is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And then you have those statements made by Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 6 when he talked about the love of money being the root of all evil or all kinds of evil. And so there's so many instances in the New Testament where the matter of money or material things is addressed. And in every situation, there seems to be the bottom line issue of what is valuable in life. Nothing has changed in that regard, has it? When you look at the world in which we live and what people of our day value, it is generally things of a material nature. They're laying up for themselves treasures here, not treasures in heaven. Jesus addressed that as well, did he not? <clears throat> and so in this particular parable, again, as in these others, he is stressing what is valuable. But also, in addition to correct their view concerning the immediate appearance of the kingdom and to address their wrong value system, he also addresses another issue and that is the need to prepare for the Lord's return. You see, when you read through this parable, if you'll just think about it very little actually, you'll see what the Lord is really saying is relative to Himself and His kingdom and the value system within that kingdom. And there are those who did not wish to be under his oversight and even sought to kill him. They did kill him. And so he's really addressing here things relative to the kingdom. But not only does he address those issues, <clears throat> but in this parable he also addresses the question of reward and punishment. That's answered right here. When he returns and he calls into account those to whom he had given these various amounts of money, those who had used it wisely were rewarded. The man who had been given the <clears throat> 10 pounds had, had gained others, or had, one had gained 10 pounds, he said, you'll be rewarded. You'll be given authority over 10 cities. The man who had been given the pound and gained five pounds. To him it was said, you'll have authority over five cities. So they were rewarded for that which they had done during this time period. What that simply says to us is that there is coming a time when we will in fact stand before the Lord to give account of how we have used that with which we have been blessed in this life. That is one point of similarity between the parable of the talents and the parable of the pounds, the matter of accountability. So he deals with this matter of reward and punishment in that regard. You may recall in Matthew chapter 25, 
I believe, one of the greatest sections of Scripture on the need for preparation in the first few verses, how to prepare in the center section, and the reward or punishment for preparation or lack thereof in the latter section. But when you come down to the very closing verse, verse 46, after he's talked about those on the left hand, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. There is reward, there is punishment. Depending on the way the one, one has exercised, the use of those things which he has been blessed in this life. The matter of stewardship. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul talks about stewardship. James talks about the matter of stewardship. And it is simply stated that it is expected of God that a man be found faithful as a steward. Now, steward is just simply one, as in this case, who has something entrusted to him for safekeeping until a latter time, a latter point in time. The song, Count Your Many Blessings. That would be most difficult, wouldn't it? Especially if you get very specific. God has so richly blessed us in this life with so many good things, but in essence what He has done is placed in our hands, is placed in our care and keeping those things that we have. One day we'll have to give an account of the kind of stewards that we have been relative to the blessings that we have received from the hand of God as was noted in the prayer a few moments ago. What would we have in this life if it were not for those things that God has given to us? We wouldn't have anything, would we? We'd have nothing. And so He has entrusted to us all of these material blessings that we enjoy. So there is that principle of stewardship that is also set forth in this section so some of these points of, of interest out of, this, out of this context, the background of it and the occasion is suggested in verse 11. As they heard these things. Now keep in mind the first few verses of this chapter is the occasion of the Lord visiting Zacchaeus. And you remember that story. How he had told Zacchaeus to come down out of that sycamore tree, I'm going to, to eat with you, I'm going to dine with you, and the things that transpired in connection with that. That is the context out of which all of this comes. And he notes here that there's a problem in their thinking about the coming kingdom. I want to think about some of the things that Jesus had taught. Think about some of the things that John the Baptist had taught. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. You can find such, uh, such statements as that in Matthew chapter 3 where John himself made that statement. You can find, uh, for example, in Matthew chapter 10 when the limited commission was given and those went out to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Their message was the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so it would be a logical conclusion from that that here is a time coming when the kingdom was right there. And it was. But Jesus wanted them to understand that there was more to this than just the coming of the kingdom itself. That's what had been taught. When you read these passages, Jesus wants them to understand, yes, I know you're concerned about the coming of the kingdom. It is at hand. It's right around the corner. But what you need to realize is, is the value system that's going to be involved with that kingdom. How do you live in that kingdom? Who is over that kingdom? 
You're going to give an account of your conduct within the kingdom. All of those things. He wanted them to understand at this point. With regard to the parable of the talents and the pounds, as we've already mentioned, they're not the same even though they're great similarities. You might recall that the parable of the talents was given on Mount, the Mount of Olives. This particular parable was given at Jericho, two different locations. This is before Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. The parable of the talents was given three days later. And so there's several things about these two parables and, and what we know about them that tell us that they are different indeed. As a matter of fact, there's a great deal of difference in the value of that which is presented. For example, each man here in, the, in this parable was given a pound. That's about $16, $18 in our money. Those who were given the talents, the five talent, the two talent, and the one talent, they were given different amounts, and the, the money value was extremely greater in the parable of the talents. Talent was about $1,000. And so you'll notice when Jesus comes to the rewarding here, he says, Thou hast been faithful in a very little. In other words, you've been given about $16, $18. You've been, you've been uh, uh, faithful in the use of that. And now you're going to be rewarded as a result of that. A lot of times when we talk about the parable of the talents, we emphasize that every man was given a different amount of talents. And we make the observation that every individual in the kingdom of God has, has different talent, different ability, whatever. We're to use what we have. God's going to uh, cause us to answer based on what we have and how we've used it, not what somebody else has. But they had a lot to be responsible for in that parable. Sixteen, eighteen dollars here. Have you ever heard anybody say, I'll tell you one thing, if I had been blessed with a lot more material blessings in this life than I've been blessed with, I could do so much more for the cause of Christ. I could do so much more for, for people in need. What are you doing with what little you have? Are you hoarding it up for yourself? Or are you using it? What kind of steward are you in that regard? I, I think that's one of the, the great lessons and concepts in this particular parable. But they both involve this matter of accountability. You see, the test here was their dependability and their faithfulness. For bigger things ahead. Look at verse 17 again. Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in very little, have thou authority over ten cities. Now, how much difference is there in the responsibility here? From being responsible for sixteen, eighteen dollars to being responsible for the authority over ten cities. If we can show our faithfulness in few things, then God can bless us in greater things. If we're not so faithful in the use of, of what we might consider the little that we do have, then why should we expect God to bless us with greater things? And yet that's the reasoning, the false reasoning of far too many people. You see, what's really involved here is the fact that life is a sacred trust that God has given to us. That's what life really is. A sacred trust that's been given to us. You'll notice when he calls these ten servants and he delivered them the ten pounds, he said unto them, Occupy till I Come. You see, he's not so much concerned here with the kingdom 
that's about to come, and that's what seemingly was their concern. But what he's trying to get them to see is that, that eventually I'm going to come back. And so while I'm gone, you occupy, and the word occupy here literally means you trade therewith. You use it. You, you benefit from it. You gain by it until I come. That represents our time here on this earth, whether long or short. We have known of those whose lives were cut very short. We have known of others who have lived what we might call to a mid-life point in years. Then we know others who, who live extremely long lives. And as we often say with regard to those who, especially those who've lived a short life, it's not so much how long we live, but how we live. And I think that's the real point that Jesus is making in this regard. Regardless of how long or short our lifespan may be, how well do we use the life that has been trusted in us in that regard? Time now is time for preparing for eternal life. What we have now, what we have been blessed with in this life, is so small compared to the blessing that we will receive when the Lord returns, we've been faithful. What we've been blessed with here might be parallel to the 16 or 18 dollars. But the 10 cities or the 5 cities would be parallel to the eternal blessing that we'll have when the Lord returns. So, so if we're faithful with a little here, we'll be in eternity with God when this life is over. But then the Lord returns. We know He's going to return. The nobleman returns. They have to give account. They're going to receive something far greater, far better than the blessings that they've enjoyed in this life. Matthew chapter 25 speaks of the return of the Lord. Beginning with about verse 31. Down through the end of the chapter, we alluded to this a moment ago. He's going to call everybody before him, those on the left, those on the right. Can you imagine the occasion of standing before the judge of the world and hear him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joys of thy Lord. Whatever we have enjoyed in this life will not begin to compare with that. I think about Paul's statement as he writes to the church at Corinth. And he talks about the light afflictions, which are but for a moment. And then he talks about that exceeding and eternal weight of glory, light afflictions, an eternal weight of glory, so much better, so far greater. That's what we need to see in this life. That's what we need to see about this life. That yes, God has entrusted us with, we think of it a lot. We've been so richly blessed in this country, but it's little compared to what we'll receive if we're faithful stewards of what we now have. What an encouragement that is to the faithful child of God. Now, it should serve as a warning to those who are not faithfully using what they have, but it ought to serve as a point of encouragement to those who are striving to live that, that faithful Christian life. What has the Lord given to us? Money, time, abilities, opportunities, families. What kind of stewards are we in that regard? Count your many blessings. You ever tried to do that? The servants in this story represent us. How are you using 
Which one of these servants represents me? Which one of these servants represents you? The one who's using what you have to, to gain far more? The one who's using what he has to gain some more? Or the one who's not using the blessing with which we've been entrusted? Which one represents me? Which one represents you? But then you'll notice within the story, the very last verse that we read, verse 27, but those mine enemies which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. What about those who are enemies of the Lord today? You remember what Jesus said on one occasion? He that is not with me is against me. He that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. So it's not a matter of neutrality. We're either for him or we're against him. This parable says to us that those who are his enemies, those who are against him, he said, you bring them and slay them. Those who are enemies of the Lord will be punished eternally in the devil's hell. Where do you stand in all of this picture tonight? In your life, how you're using what you have? Are you for the Lord? Are you against Him? Great lessons that we can learn on accountability and responsibility from the parable of the pounds. If you're not a child of God tonight, you're obviously against Him. If you remain in that condition until the Lord returns, then you will be treated as an enemy, not as a friend, not as a servant. You can change that tonight. If you're not a child of God, you can become one. Based upon your faith in Christ, you can turn away from a life of sin, confess that faith, be buried with your Lord in baptism, come out of that watery grave, a new creature in Christ. Romans 6, 3 and 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. You can become that new creature tonight as a child of God you've not been a faithful servant you've been so richly blessed but you haven't used it very wisely you'll need to change that maybe you don't need to respond publicly you just need to change some things about your life allow this parable of the pounds to help us understand accountability responsibility in the short time that we are here in order that we can gain much, much more in the life to come. If you're not ready for that and we can assist you, let it be known. We stand together and sing this song.
Uh, thanks to Sydney for those fine lessons today, for all others that had a public part in our worship assembly. For those that were not here this morning, we would ask you to please fill out an attendance card, leave that on the table in the foyer so that we may have a record of your visit with us today. Again, I remind you of those that are on our prayer list, and it's grown somewhat since this morning, I'm sorry to say. Sister Ruby Davis, who was a former member here, now lives in the Huntsville, uh, Alabama area, is not doing well. Her address is on the bulletin board here in the hallway if you wish to send her and her family a card. You're also asked to continue to remember Brother Ray Spake, who was with us this morning. We were glad to see him. Sister Joan Thurman, who continues to recover from recent surgery at home. Sue Roberts also continues to recover. She is making some uh, slow improvements. The doctor has said that she's doing well, so we're certainly glad to report that. Frida Gray, however, has not been doing well. If you could remember her in your prayer and call her on occasion, I'm sure she would appreciate that also. You're also asked to remember Cheryl Edwards' aunt, Barbara Lyle. We again extend our sympathy to the family of Reed Braswell in his passing last night. We do not have any specific arrangements at this time. We think perhaps he, the funeral may be here in Bremen at Hightower, but we don't know that at this time. As soon as we get that information, we will pass it along to you. Honey Wilson uh, hopefully has been released from the hospital. We think that she has, but she has yet been able to make the trip back up here, so she's going to stay in Florida for at least a few more days. We don't know exactly how long, but... Uh, we do think that she is out of the hospital at this time. You're asked to remember the granddaughter of Jimmy and Aileen Brannon, Paula Kettle, who's to have back surgery tomorrow. Also, Lola's sister, Videra Marlowe, is to have a heart surgery tomorrow at Emory. Also, this morning, some of you may have seen Brother Frank Head was not feeling well. He is now in the hospital at Tanner in Carrollton, room 3. 363, room 363. He's waiting on a couple of doctors to come see him. He had some high blood pressure, we know, but uh, Brother Frank Head is at Tanner Hospital, room 363 in Carrollton as we speak. Janice Jones also is not feeling well this morning. She's to have tests tomorrow. We do not know where, but we do know that she's to have tests tomorrow. Shirley Smallwood also was not feeling well this morning. She went to the doctor and she's been diagnosed with pneumonia. She's not in the hospital. She's at home trying to recover from that. But certainly we need to remember Sister Smallwood. Immediately after our evening service tonight in the fellowship hall, there's a teacher's meeting for those who have taught, those who wish to teach, those who are teaching, we would ask you to please stick around for just a few moments immediately after we dismiss in the fellowship hall for a brief teacher's meeting. Also, Brothers Keepers Group 1 will meet tonight at the home of Jimmy and Jan uh, later this evening. Bremen's Week at Camp begins next Sunday, the 20th. For those who wish to register, you may do so online. There's some, pick, uh, some registration forms that you may pick up in the foyer and fill those out. The fee is $150 per, count, per camper. Um, there is also a staff and counselors meeting this coming Tuesday, day after tomorrow, 7 p.m. here at the building for those who are participating as staff members or counselors for camp. Again, that is this coming Tuesday, day after tomorrow, here at the building, 7 p.m. Brothers Keepers Group 2 will meet next Sunday evening after the evening service at mine and Tammy's home. Ice cream and desserts are the fare. Next Sunday afternoon, 4.30, there is a VBS teachers meeting. Again, VBS teachers meeting next Sunday afternoon, 4.30 here at the building. Also, next Friday, the 18th of June, will be the area-wide singing here at Bremen. There's a lot of activities upcoming, and hopefully we'll be able to keep you informed. But please mark your calendar for next Friday, 18th of June, 7 p.m. here at the building, area-wide singing and we will prov uh, provide the finger foods for all that are coming. So if you would, please make your plans to get some finger foods up here so that we can make sure that we host our guests well, as we always do. Also, you may have noticed in the foyer, it's change for children time again, believe it or not. We just sent these off, seems like not long ago, and now they've sent them back to us empty. There's nothing in here. 
there are plenty of cans out in the foyer for the next three months or so get one of these cans get one of those little white sheets of paper fill it out with your name and address and so forth stick it down in the can fill them up for the next three months and we'll tell you when we'll be ready to collect those but there are several cans out in the foyer we've got some more when those run out so grab a can also there were some glasses that were found in one of the downstairs classrooms if these are yours they are here for you to retrieve Brothers Keepers Group 4 will meet June the 26th at the home of Larry and Joan. More details coming soon. Brothers Keepers Group 4, June 26th. The Lord's Supper is also kept prepared for those that wish to observe it. It's in the library this evening. Second door on the left down this hallway, there will be someone there to serve you. Our summer series continues this Wednesday, 7 p.m. Brother Larry Acuff, no stranger to us here, will be speaking this coming Wednesday, so you'll certainly want to be here for that. Surely I have not overlooked anything, but there is a possibility. Anything else that we should mention at this time? Final song. 478. 478 is our final song. If you'll stand, we'll sing and be dismissed. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this privilege we've had to come here today to worship you. Pray, Heavenly Father, that everything that's been said and done has been pleasing and acceptable on our side. Pray, Heavenly Father, that we'll take what we've heard and apply it to our lives, if it be thy will. Pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll bless those that's mentioned in the announcements of being sick, those that are bereaved. Pray you suit unto them the blessings thou alone know they stand in need of, and help us to do and say the things we need to do and say to help them along the way. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the many blessings you so richly and abundantly bless us with each and every day of our lives. And pray, Heavenly Father, we'll take these and live these, use these blessings to live a Christian life. Pray, Heavenly Father, we're thankful for thy Son that you sent to die on the cruel cross of Calvary for our sins. Help us to not take that lightly and remember it each and every day. Pray, Heavenly Father, you go with us as we leave here. Keep us safe and from harm's way, and be with us until we meet again. In Christ's name we pray, amen.